Hello, everyone. My name is Michael Cosmopoulos. I am the chair of Greek studies at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. And on behalf of the university and also of AMSEL Global and the Greek professorship, I would like to welcome you to this second of our lectures in the Greece in Missouri 21 series. This series is comprised of a series of, of a number of events stretching into 2022 because of COVID, commemorating the 200th anniversary for, from the Greek War of uh, Revolution. This particular lecture is the annual Diane Tuliatos lecture. Diane Tuliatos is a distinguished professor of Byzantine studies here at the University of Missouri, St. Louis. Upon her retirement, her family and her husband, Mr. Gus Miles, uh, end out this lecture series to honor her life and her work. Diane has also been a driving force behind the development of Greek studies uh, in, in our area. Today's speaker is one of the most distinguished modern uh, Greek specialists. Professor Gonda uh, von, von Steen was born in Belgium. She was raised and educated in Belgium before coming to the United States to receive her PhD at Princeton University. She has taught uh, at the University of Florida where she held the CASAS chair in Greek studies. And since 2018, she is the first woman to ever hold the Korais Chair of Modern Greek and Byzantine History, Language and Literature at King's College, a Center for Hellenic Studies and Department of Classics in London. She has also served as President and also Executive Director of the Modern Greek Studies Association. Her specialties are the Greek language and literature through the Byzantine and modern Greek periods, Western travelers to Greece and the Ottoman Empire, 19th and 20th century receptions of the classics, especially theater, and modern Greek intellectual and social history. She is the author of numerous publications and several books, the latest of which Adoption, Memory, and Cold War Greece, Kid Pro Quo, is, uh, a person, is an examination of the personal stories of children, Greek children who were adopted by US families following the Second World War. Uh, th this book has been awarded several prizes and it's a major contribution, not just to modern Greek history, but also to the, his, to the US adoption history, because this, uh, these adoptions uh, uh, became sort of major movement uh, in both Greek and, and American society. Today's lecture, the Greek revolution of 1821 and its multiple anniversary, that means how the different anniversaries of uh, historical events in Greece uh, have been shaped and are shaping uh, per our perceptions of the past. Without further ado, Professor Van Steen, we are very honored to have you here today with us. Well, thank you, Michael. It's an honor to be asked to give the Diane Tuliatos lecture. And I'm especially grateful for you for this wonderful introduction and for signaling my work on the Greek adoptions. If, if any of you in the audience, if for any of you this history strikes home, I always extend a warm invitation for people to contact me because there is a lot of, of work to be done in what I call this unfinished business of the Greek adoptions to the US. Today then, our topic is very different, and I'm very pleased to have the technical assistance of Bob L, who's been absolutely excellent in setting this up and leading you also in the audience uh, to this forum and assisting us with the questions. I have fond memories of meeting Diane Tuliatos many years ago, a force of nature, very inspiring, and she told me proudly that she hails from Kefalonia. And that the name Tuliatos just tells you that I will never forget. So again, it is my great honor to be here with you. And I hope I can keep the conversation uh, rather relaxed. Um, I will be speaking from a few notes and about 18 slides. And I hope in the end we will engage in conversation and questions. So I invite everybody in the audience to take an active part in it. 
So here we are then celebrating the Greek Revolution and we can already reflect on its multiple anniversaries. 1871, after 50 years, 1921, after 100 years, 1971, 2021. You see where we are going with that. Anniversaries create legacies. And so it's important then to think what each one of these anniversaries has added to the package of how we celebrate and how we think about the Greek past. And also what, what kind of images we bring to that celebration of the Greek past. Who are the heroes? Who are the characters? What, are the, what is the iconography of these celebrations? And I'm going to start with this iconic picture of Rios here and Korais, the skinnier guy, lifting up Greece, dragged, um, dragged from the ruins. Uh, she is in rags, she's wounded, she's feeble, but uh, Rikas Ferios and Adamandios Korais are going to lift her up literally from the ruins of antiquity with the Ottoman Turkish enemy in the background, surrounded by symbols that will stay with this history of celebrating Greece's resurrection, if you want. There is the symbol of the phoenix, the mythical bird rising from its ashes with quite a history already in ancient myth, but with a history that is regenerated in 1821. And then of course, there are the religious symbol as in these angelic characters up high. So keep that image in mind because uh, you will be surprised to, to see how much of the celebrations of these these go back to what is what are like staples, key ingredients that come back with renew, renewed force. So these anniversaries then start reflecting on the passing of time, as anniversaries naturally do, but they take the opportunity to, to, to kind of set an agenda for the present, make a certain, uh, a few points about who is in charge of this celebrating, and of course, set an, a prospect, a vision for the future. And of course, the future are the younger generations, so a lot of this celebrating has a didactic uh, quality to it, telling future generations of how to live up to an ethos created by the recent and older Greek past. So not surprisingly then, these legacies become rather prescriptive, holding up standards and norms, and they become rather nationalist as well. And part of this package, these staple goods of anniversary celebration, will be the constant reminder of some sort of a linear progression from the past through the present, over challenges, but ultimately to success. And in this linear progression, it does not surprise us that religion and state very often come very close together in that kind of symbiotic relationship that is still very present in Greece. It needs to be immediately noted that none, absolutely none of these four major uh, anniversaries was celebrated in a period that was not crisis. And so uh, challenges, crisis are again a, a kind of underpinning of my talk today. The most potent one will probably have been 1921, I'll come to it soon, when the crisis was so acute, actually celebrations were postponed until 1930, veering off of the schedule of celebrating on the 100th anniversary. So anniversary, yes, but crisis was always, think of financial crises, think of uh, uh, natural disasters, think of a refugee crises, and think of course of the most uh, current and persisting COVID crisis. So the unpredictable, the unforeseen crisis was there to plague the 25th of March, 2021, and we're not quite done yet. Here we are. I want to take you to the landscape of 
down to, downtown Athens. I'm taking you to Panepistimiou Street and to the three buildings that crown Panepistimiou Street, kind of in the middle between Sindagma and Omonia Square. They are the Athens University official buildings, the, the, the kind of gala buildings. And we call the middle building the Propylia, the, 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 the porch of the Athens University building. And of course, there's some sort of a plaza around it. And it's at this plaza where we start our venture in 1871 anniversary celebration of the revolution on the occasion of the 50 year uh, jubilee. And sure enough, on the plaza of Panepistimi New Street, in front of the institution, uh, classicizing institution, uh, conservative institution of Athens University back then, we, we're going to be looking at the outer corners of the building. The first that you will be investigating will be sitting on the far right, the second one will be sitting on the far left, and the third one will be sitting right here. So starting then with the character uh, whose history, whose personal fate was most involved with the Greek Revolution itself. Ecumenical Patriarch Gregory V, whose statue you see here. The statue was erected in 1872. Mind you, delaying a little bit or missing anniversary by a few years becomes a little bit of a recurrent theme as well. Not everything gets done on time, so bear, bear with the plan. So sure enough, Gregory V had, had the, the impossible task, actually, of being ordered by the Ottoman uh, uh, authority to keep a lid on Greek revolutionary feelings in 1821. And then when that could not happen, then he is one of the first victims of Ottoman retaliation. He was killed in the immediate aftermath of the outbreak of the revolution. His body was desecrated and, and disappeared for a while. It shows up in Odessa. It's then being kept by Russia. In 1871, in the lead up to 1871, the Greeks finally in diplomatic exchanges uh, achieve that they can bring the relics back of uh, Patriarch Gregory V. And that will be celebrated with a reburial in the Metropolitan Cathedral in Athens. Uh, the royal couple is it in, in attendance. This becomes an Athenocentric and a religious nationalist event. And on the occasion, a statue is ordered by Yorgos uh, Vitalis. Here you see it. So, so an interesting reflection on revolutionary events, uh, 50 years old, but also on that symbiotic relationship between church and state. When we then move to the other end of the building, we see the statue by Rigas Ferreus, also called Rigas Velestin Lis by Ioannis Kossos. And of course, with Rigas, we, we, we are no longer in religious territory. We are, we are dealing with the secular champion of the Greek Revolution. Rigas, who was very influenced by the French Enlightenment, had not a Greek nationalist narrow vision in, in mind for Greece, but rather some sort of a Balkan state uh, vision. But of course, it was never materialized because as a precursor to the revolution, he actually fell victim again to assassination and murder of the enemies. But here he is being commemorated as a figure in what is clearly a classical outfit, right? So th these are artistic images of the Greek revolutionary history, but done in a pretty conservative classicizing style in front of a building that represents an institution that is itself classicizing and conservative. So we are not exactly, on the occasion of anniversaries, we're not exactly seeing kind of bold artistic revelations in sculpture. So the time for that has not yet come. And then, on to the third statue in that very Athenocentric, if I may, landscape of revolutionary figures in downtown Athens. Here is Adamandios Korais, who was actually the expatriate thinker. He's down in France, the expatriate thinker of how Greece could come about, uh, how learning and education should be a major pillar in the development of Greece. That means, of course, education targeted at young 
male Greeks. That is the didactic dimension again. And how, how every state and, the, and the, the, the emerging Greek state needs every possible um, pillar of cultural infrastructure to make this happen. So he is the precursor of text editions, the Hellenic Library, uh, preserving monuments. He even had plans to open an archaeological museum on the island of Chios, where he was from. He also thinks ahead of, of collecting. Uh, uh, he has uh, things to say about the recreation of theater. So you can see that he thinks of a cultural infrastructure that is much larger than preserving of the religion or, of, or, or borrowing, let's say, from the French Enlightenment. Adamandius Corais, whose, um, whose position is eternalized in the Corais chair at the university uh, at King's College London, which I'm honored to hold. His statue came about in 1875, again, a slight delay. So the conception of continuity is immediately present. And of course, other, other factors in addition to the statues come into play and we need to discuss them briefly to, to kind of draw a line from statues to reenactments, to parades, to um, athletic festivals, uh, to cinema, to parade floats, to uh, the kind of parade you saw with televisions present and speech making. Uh, on the recent occasion on the 25th. So you can kind of see an evolution of modest beginning of celebrating that take on a greater and greater and more and more international dimension to then come to where we recently were. What is then the kind of academic scholarly underpinning of this insistence on continuity? Work of Constantinos Paparigopoulos, who wrote the, the history of the Hellenic nation in multiple volumes in the mid 19th century, a, a history that has been constantly republished. So very, very influential work, and, and a work that carved out a, a vision in which modern Greece could, without too many problems, bring together ancient Byzantine and modern, even though that meant wedding pagan religion to uh, Byz Byzantine Orthodox Greek religion to the modern kind of tension between secular state and religious state. Paparagopoulos uh, uh, creates that all encompassing vision of continuity. Now, mind you, his, his picture was more complex, but it has been kind of deduced to these three components, ancient, Byzantine, and modern, that we credit back to him. Now, mind you, he wasn't the only thinker on the subject. Ioannis Coletis, who held a ministerial post in 1835 under King Otto, saw something in the power of public festivals, open air public festivals, in the way that these had so productively brought the ancient Greeks together. And think of, for instance, the athletic festivals of the Olympic Games, the Nemean Games, the Isthmian Games, the Pythian Games in Delphi. And so Colette says, we can do something, not just with statues, but with the whole recreation of moving images, a moving visual culture. So a visual program that is not just static and architectural, like on Panepistimio Street, but that, that, that brings reenactments and parades in front of mass audiences on the model of the ancient athletic games and not the, just the athletic games, also the Panathenaic games and all these famous uh, and games and festivals of antiquity. And sure enough, what is ideal then is athletic prowess, male athletic uh, achievement, which will uh, 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 first of all, appeal to very many. It will be a unifying factor. And it's also a way, you know, male athletic achievement is also a way of sending messages to your neighbors that is male athletic strength can be transformed at any time in military strength. So it's kind of a national parade that reflects and incorporates history, but also sends signals of we have the manpower and are strong enough. And sure enough, the first modern Olympics will then be that kind of catalyst in this building of 
legacies and visual programs again in downtown Athens. So Coletis, with his vision of uh, reenacting, resurrecting athletic games, kind of prepares, help pr prepare the ground for the first modern Olympics in 1896. Uh, along the way, Papas comes in, and of course, the Frenchman Pierre de Coubertin. And sure enough, Athens is the focus, even though, think of it, if you want authenticity concerning the ancient Olympics, the place to hold them would be ancient Olympia, right? But no, that, that's, that's not in the same way convenient. Ancient Olympia is not in the same way accessible in the late 19th century. So if you want international impact and resonance, the only place to to get that is, of course, in Athens, in the refurbished Panathenaic Stadium, the stadium that we today call the Kali Marmaro, which sits right there, again, in the center of Athens, opposite the National Gardens. And sure enough, here you see the potential of such venues. You bring tons and tons of people together and you, create, you create, can parade your vision in front of people and let it be judged and be written up in newspapers and everything internationally. Very powerful tool. It won't be the first regime to do so. And then this is the kind of iconography that comes back in, in, in full force with all that we start to recognize. A combination of Olympiakia Gones with the French influence, Le Jeu Olympique. A combination of uh, contemporary modern Greek costume next to ancient imagery. The, the ancient columns are present, but also the refurbished Panathenaic Stadium with the Temple of the Olympian Zeus and with the Acropolis in the background. And of course, the dates are there for you in case you were to forget that the ancient Olympics started in 1776 and that the new modern Olympics will be resurrected, were resurrected in 1896, as if, as if the continuity of centuries was uninterrupted, which we know it wasn't, but, but, but this image doesn't uh, tell you that continuity can be shaped and, and be embellished a little bit. So then we 1920, a very problematic times, of course. Uh, we need to talk here about a key figure whose name is Eleftherios Venizelos, who was from the island of Crete, and that's important. Uh, Venizelos sees in this um, developing culture of parades and mass events a great propagandistic tool, and that is spe specifically useful for Venizelos because he has a plan. He is the, the, the carrier of what we know as the grand idea, the Megali idea. He is the main advocate for um, taking advantage of international goodwill after the Paris Peace Conference in 1919, and again after the Treaty of Sèvres in 1920, for taking Greek troops into Asia Minor and thus redeeming the Greek populations of Asia Minor and bringing them into Greater Greece. This means landing Greek troops on the coast of Asia Minor and then making, uh, making a go for Smyrna and eventually, of course, the ultimate prize, Constantinople. A big plan, a very dangerous plan. It didn't turn out that way, needless to say. So what happens then, if Venizelos goes in with so much self-confidence that by mid-September 1920, which is a good several months in advance of the uh, anniversary celebration, he starts to stage the first, the first victory celebrations, which is, of course, way too soon and almost hubristically so. And he uses that same Panathenaic Stadium for parades that are very, not only Athenocentric, but very Venizelos-centric. And it, it, it opens the first window to celebrations as some sort of a powerful personal propaganda tool in the same way that we hadn't seen them yet in the 19th century. And sure enough, wait a few months, and by the 25th of March, 1921, Greece has suffered the first military setbacks in Asia Minor, because the new Turkish nationalist forces are beating back the Greeks, and it's clearly not looking good. By mid-September 1922, the Smyrna disaster has happened, and the new Turkish forces have pushed out 
uh, not only the Greek minority, but also the Armenian minority, and cre created lots of victims in the process. So this is not exactly the time to then stage a huge nationalist celebrations. What this done in the span of this time is some moderate speech making, committees with academics are formed, plans are being made, but everybody realizes um, uh, this is a time of mourning, not exactly a time of nationalist celebration. And so the, the ultimate solution then is to postpone the anniversary celebration to 1930. And again, somewhat hubristically so, because Venizelos is still convinced that all these territorial gains he's dreaming of will be realized, if not by 1922, at least by 1930. Again, a big mistake, but at least he gave himself kind of, dare I say, a new lease on life, right? Uh, uh, crediting himself eight more years. And now in the history of Greek, the Greek Revolution, that's actually quite feasible. This is not an invented date of because 1830 was the formal beginning of Greek statehood. So you could use then 1930 as a celebration, not of the outbreak of the Greek Revolution, but of the, the, the formal beginning the 100 years since the formal beginning of Greek statehood. So you could easily kind of spin that a little bit and still justify the link, make it look uh, not a, a matter of defeat, but a matter of, there I say, increased anticipation. And sure enough, what Venizelos then focuses on is filling the years in the lead up to 1930 with a few more ambitious projects that keep the attention focused on the postponed celebration. And one such major product is the building of the tomb of the unknown soldier. And this is the one on Sindagma Square. You've been there many times. Uh, it's it's uh, right in, the house, in front of the Houses of Parliament. Today, you see the changing of the guard. You can see that this, this, this whole facade needed quite some work. This was a multi-year project, and it was actually not even finished in 1930, but, but the plans at least kept the momentum going. And another, another invention of Venizelos to kind of give a personal, but then also uh, important spin to this anticipated celebration of 1930 is the rededication of the equestrian statue of the revolutionary hero Kolokotronis, whom you see here, and his statue stands on Platia Kolokotronis in front of the old uh, parliament building, and he points uh, forward. And so the statue already existed, but it's being rededicated. And Venizelos wants his name associated with it because Kolokotronis in the revolutionary history has come to stand as not only the revolutionary hero, but the anti royalist revolutionary hero. And you can see that the identification there with Venizelos is complete and that people are starting to create kind of genealogies with this revolutionary history. It's clear that you can kind of pick and choose a little bit from collectively so further a more personal agenda. So I want to put two very potent slides next to one another. In 1921, you see the Greeks triumphantly leading the path uh, to uh, the capital of Constantinople, the, uh, the, the famous uh, mosque structure there waiting to be recaptured. But give it another year and you see the refugee tents on the ancient Agora in Athens, in the shadow of the temple of Hephaestus, the Tision actually, Hephaestion. And you see what started as a triumphant march into Asia Minor becomes a, a, a crisis of refugees, Greece having to take in hundreds and hundreds of people who have to flee from various places in Asia Minor and uh, for which Greece doesn't immediately have the infrastructure. So what really happens between 1921 and 1930 is Greece in a, in a, in a very difficult struggle 
of adjusting to this defeat, building the infrastructure, uh, uh, coping with this influx of refugees who had to leave everything behind. And I think these two images next to each other, um, you know, the tents in the shadow of the ancient temple are quite poignant. Okay, one thing that seems to come back time and again is commemorative medals, coinage, or, or medals in this case. So, so no opportunity goes to waste, not even in 2020, as you will soon see, to kind of identify uh, the upmarch of Greece, the rise of Greece with that symbol of the phoenix again, and with territorial expansion. So one of the coins struck to celebrate that 100th anniversary of nationhood since 1830 is the very memorial coin that tells you exactly how Greece has expanded. And it has expanded with the Ionian Islands, given up by Britain in 1864. 1820, of course, is already the date of of the, the, that small part of the mainland, but 1881 is the acquisition of Thessaly, 1913 is the acquisition of Macedonia, Balkan Wars, and then in the latest um, acquisition, 1919 Eastern Trace. So you can see that the coin is there to commemorate not just territorial expansion, but also a sense of unity as we rise together like the ancient phoenix. And so one of the things that Venizelos then also does, still stuck on, on some of these ancient parades, is he recreates the Panathenaic procession of antiquity. And he does that with, instead of, like in antiquity, various groups carrying the garment of Athena uh, to the Acropolis, he will have various regions of Greece carrying the Greek flag to the Acropolis as a way to give every region a way to participate in this visual rhetoric of unification. And another act that he likes to put on in the, in the sequence of ancient Byzantine and modern, Venzelos likes to put on there as well the Minoan culture, being from Crete, making a point that in this constellation of territorial gain, Greece has a lot to offer. So he, he temporarily expands the linear progression from ancient uh, Byzantine to modern uh, by including the legacy of his own homeland of Crete. He gets a lot of help here from unexpected corners. For instance, the Lyceum of Greek women, the Lycio Elinidon, is very much into parading the rich culture of various regions of Greece. Not in a military sense, but in a sense of regional dress, costumes, and they will do regular parades of this kind of cultural progression, cultural continuity, again in the Panathenaic Stadium, which now becomes the local par excellence, and this kind of reenacting of Greece through the ages, all the way to modern times, with the Greek Revolution as a component, becomes very much a culture in which not just the military or, or the politicians participate, but also a prominent educational institution, such as the Lycio Elinidon, the Lyceum of Greek Women. And then we come to the Greek military dictatorship, which came into power with the coup of 1820, uh, sorry, uh, 21 April, um, get my 21s confused here, 21, 1967, stood through the middle of 1974. So by the time the 100th anniversary of the Greek Revolution comes, in 1971, we are kind of midway through, but we don't know that at that point. In fact, the dictatorship is already lasting much longer than people had given it credit for. Again, we find ourselves in that same Panathenaic Stadium, almost as as full as at the time of the Olympic Games. Uh, dignitaries present press present, cameras present, not just the statues, but the entire floats, and clearly some sort of a milita militarizing of these festivals where the military regime, the colonels, really kind of show off their hardware uh, uh, as a way of saying, 
don't mess with us. Uh, but of course, there is more needed to legitimate a regime. And, and one of the things that the colonels specifically do is to place themselves in some sort of an ancestral lineage, a genealogy. Okay, of, of how their own revolution, and, and children of they call it a revolution, their own nation-saving revolution, as they call it, fits into a long tradition, a very Greek tradition of revolutions. And they make this visually um, uh, manifest in, in festivals that they call Hyortes uh, Polemikis Aratiston Helinon, festivals of the polemic virtue of the Greeks. Mind you, they even create a national holiday out of the day they came into power, the 21st of April, 67. And so what they do is then they recreate the symbol of the phoenix, putting the soldier in front of it, the soldier as kind of the, 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 the courageous bulwark of the regime. And they place their soldier, their military regime, in a tradition that goes all the way back to Thermopylae, molon la over Alexander the Great, over Constantine the Great and his victory at the Melvian Bridge, over Eleftheria et Thanatos of 1821, over Aera and Ochi of 1940s Greece and the offense against Mussolini and eventually against Hitler. So this is deliberate creating an, a lineage of, of, of revolutionary sentiment and even revolutionary battle cries, if you want, in which the regime then, as some sort of an act of self-celebration, rather without hesitation, places itself as the ultimate final marker. And, and of course, the, the, the future is unending. What the uh, colonels have going for them is they are, they are the first one to have new and exciting media at their exposure. Radio already exists, but television is new and exciting. And for the better part of the military regime, it actually belongs to the Greek armed forces. And then there is... And we underestimate, again, the power of moving images, which now take on a whole dimension by being cast in these grand war epics of episodes of the Greek Revolution. And the colonels actually put some money towards it, so they kind of get the products uh, they are looking for. And you see movies emerging, such as the Suriotises or Papa Flesas, the hero of the Greek Revolution, with some pretty big name, Dimitri, uh, uh, Dimitris Papa Mikhail, for instance. So you get these war epics of courageous Greeks fighting the Turks under the sign of the Greek cross. Grand productions, money being spent on grand productions and on the promotion of these grand productions, to the extent that these characters with their fierce mustaches and helmets become, become very much imprinted in our mind. And I find this actually a very topic to look at 1821 in the film culture through time. And it's certainly something um, we in London want to do more with. And I want to invite you to join us on May 28, coming up soon, for a session where we'll discuss just that, cinema's interpretation of 1821. And I promise you some good film clips on the occasion as well. I can give you more information uh, second. Now, mind you, the junta invites uh, grand ideas, but also sometimes, you know, over the top ideas. And so, uh, because things are so spectacularized on an unimaginable scale, it's, it's not surprising that the junta invites some ridicule as well. Here you see Jenny Carezi, who's discovering herself as some sort of a revolutionary heroine with the waving helmets of 1821. She is acting in a movie called Lizzie Strata, but she's actually using the wording of the uh, of the colonels of 1821 uh, while kind of comically inverting it. The movie is called Lizzie Strati, and she is using slogans such as a minister with that kind of katarevusa overtone that is meant to kind of deflate the language of the colonels. 
the ancient 1821 and uh, 1971, 1972 coming uh, together in a clash. I told you about the power of coinage. And so it's, it's worth then to devote a few slides to what 2021 has brought and how it has embraced some of the uh, channels, some of the platforms to put its message out there that we now start to recognize. So here is commemorative coinage issued in 2021, and it goes back to uh, uh, the, uh, the Greek cross, the laurel wreath, remember the Olympics, and, and, and also the, 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 the mention of the drachme, the drachma, when it was uh, still in use before the euro and going back all the way to the earliest years of Greek statehood. But then also the phoenix, without the image of the rising bird, phoenix being one of the very early uh, uh, coins of Greece being commemorated here as two sides of one coin. One of the things that the Greek 21 committee has done in anticipation of March 25, 21 was really heavily promoting is its numismatic work. And here is such an example. But there's more to be said about that push to commemorate, and that push to commemorate sometimes in a bit of a, dare I say, uh, uh, in a frame of mind that is constantly stuck on episodes, on the big purple, purple passages, the heroic episodes of Greek history, without necessarily making the connections with social history or with honesty about setbacks and challenges in Greek history. So I, I kind of want to put that message out there by way of two cartoons. The one on the right is by the famous Kostas Metropolis, and it's actually a cartoon from 1999. But what you see is you see our average Greek very eager to put down a laurel reed in honor of some event that is meaningful for him, but, but kind of being a little puzzled as to what to choose. 1821, Okay, 1973, Polytechnio, uh, 1940, Ochide, uh, some disasters, 1453, 1922. And in the end, the future last, lies past 2000, but he's walking away from it. And not only is he walking away from it, he is actually going in circles. So, so there is a sense of like, grab the future in a different kind of way. Yes, there is commemoration, but, but up to a point. And then Kir, in the cartoon on the left here, he is there to kind of write on a wall in Athens to Polytechnio Z, Poly the Polytechnic is alive, Greece is alive, and, but the Greeks or, well, don't manage with the economic crisis. So it's like, are we too wrapped up in fiesta fatigue, commemorative fatigue to the extent that we forget that we have daily uh, crisis going on, daily challenges going on. And, and should we then not reinterpret our history a little bit to make it more friendly towards the average Greek? And of course, uh, uh, popular history meets official history in very peculiar ways. You, you couldn't make this up. These are billboards on the, uh, on the fence that surrounds the parliament building in Athens. This is uh, it, uh, you know, the site that leads to... Uh, 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 I mean, you could walk all around the fence of the parliament building to get to Erodoatiku and, and other places. But the slogan says, history has a face, history has a face, and, and all the heroes of, are, are there, the brave uh, Greek guards marching, the Tsoyades in traditional dress. Now, history has a face, yes, but at the very moment that we face the challenge of having to, to cover our face, because showing your face in 2021 doesn't quite work for the greater good. So an interesting um, contradiction here of history as a face, while we have to be so careful covering our face and masking up. Again, an interesting reflection, you know, the, the military junta, the dictatorship, had put itself, as I said, in that lineage, that literal lineage without interruption, all the way back to the Persian Wars, right, over Alexander the Great. 
uh, the committee of 2021 also creates some sort of a fluid lineage of heroic uh, ancestry, let's say. But look how the, how, how the picture is different. I would say up to up to here, up to the middle, it's pretty conventional. You recognize your Persian wars, the Mistocles, you know, the raising, uh, the raising of the flag. You recognize Bobolina, and with her, the first woman comes in. But you also recognize Papa Nicolau of the Pap Smear, and you recognize Maria Kala. So all of a sudden, women are present, and all of a sudden, also, this man needs no introduction. All of a sudden. Greekness is different. It, it can be multi-ethnic. It can be certainly uh, more than just a male history as it was 50 years ago. There is room, there's a more broader conception of who can belong to this uh, lineage that gives us cause to celebrate. So I, I, I found it an interesting reflection the working of the lineage that goes back to heroic antiquity. There's also some deconstruction of heroes going on. Here is Colocodron is literally uh, taken apart uh, in reverse engineering. Uh, all the bolts and the screws uh, being loosened up. That great hero of Colocodron is um, uh, deconstructed, unmasked to make us think of what myth making and hero making has traditionally meant. Of course, this is the year in which our connection to antiquity needs to be rethought. Here is an icon issued by the Lego classicists, as we call them, where the Greek goddess Igea is very much concerned with hands on and mass. So antiquity can be a powerful reminder that we are living in challenges challenged condi conditions, even as the Greek committee puts out colorful uh, mementos that you can buy to support the effort, we are still constantly challenged by the daily uh, restrictions of 2021. And uh, a, a year in history we could never have foreseen. And I like, and this is my last slide, I like how history and image making of the Greek Revolution meets the COVID crisis in very potent ways. Here you see some of the traditional paintings by perhaps the most famous painter of episodes of the Greek Revolution, Frisakis. Here you see Greece rising. Here you see the heroic exodus of Missolonghi, the, the, the heroic Greeks under the sign of the flag fighting of the Turks. But look what the reality is like, this heroic Exodus of Missolonghi has become the, the heroic battle of the Greek health system against uh, that daunting and, and constantly attacking enemy called the COVID pandemic. And here, real heroes of the fight of 2021, the medical personnel. And these images were issued at a very poignant moment last year, actually, at, at uh, when, when preparations were underway, uh, three Greek historians actually said, maybe 2021 is a year to spend the money on big parades and you know, political speeches and all of that. Maybe this is the year to protect our citizens first and maybe the expense should go to strengthening the Greek healthcare system. And to, to make kind of the dilemma clear, that's where these images were created. And I find them quite powerful. So the question is then, despite all these challenges, was the Greek revolution successful and worth celebrating? Yes, absolutely, of course. But it should be, instead of falling back on constantly reiterated patterns of, of which we've now seen the advantages, but also the disadvantages, uh, we, should, we should be encouraged to, to, to kind of see the images more critically and perhaps, you know, ask ourselves questions about fiesta fatigue and others, and, and certainly think of the challenge to stage a celebration that is most inclusive of everyone. And on this note, I will leave it and turn it over to you for what I hope will be a very stimulating dialogue. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Gonda. Uh, sorry, I lost. Gonda, can you uh, 
stop sharing the screen from your end or Bob? Here we are. Here we ah, are. there we are. There we are. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for such an inspiring presentation. Uh, it, it opens up a new way of understanding these commemorations. And Thank it you. gave us a lot of food, a lot of food for thought, you know, from, from the very Thank concept you. of commemorative fatigue that, that you mentioned to the shifting perceptions of, of our past. Thank and you. and uh, it, it, no, it, it's an issue that concerns me as well personally, but for ancient Greece, the way to which memory affects identity mm -hmm. and, and basic social identity and national identity. And it comes to basically, basically it comes down to a people choosing what to remember and what exactly. to forget and then how to remember what they remember. So I, I think that this was brilliant. Thank, thank you very oh, much. Thank you. Um, just to, 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 uh, to our audience, because this is a webinar, uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Just click on it, type your question, I will see it, and then I will pass it on to Professor uh, Van Steen. Uh, let me ask, let me start with one question, and then we'll move to the questions of the audience as they are uh, coming in. Um, uh, Gonda, what role did uh, Greek Orthodox uh, uh, religion play in shaping these commemorations? I mean, what agency did the Greek Orthodox Church have uh, throughout this you know, past century and a half that we have been commemorating all this? What agency did they have in shaping uh, national commemorations? Um, I would say a very big role because there wasn't a ceremony that would not be accompanied also by a, a church. And we go back all the way to the importance of the statue of pa uh, Patriarch Gregory V. So, so Greece in its celebrations was always very much aware uh, that the church, the church meant a lot to people. It was it was em embodying the Byzantine legacy rather than the ancient Greek legacy, which was pagan. So, so, so a sense that as a factor of ident identity, the Greek church needed to be present and 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 could point to the right, let's say, hero martyrs of that uh, uh, revolutionary, uh, revolutionary tradition that played a tremendous role. I would say all the way, uh, all the way through 1971. I think perhaps this year a little less. Now, mind you, the, the stories of uh, the Krifos Holio, the secret school, and, and the, the exact role of Gregory V is contested. But, but the church was aware that Squirmishes, notwithstanding, that there was a role to play there, and that that role was a unifying role, and that that it gave um, uh, flesh to the Byzantine tradition in a very concrete way. So basically, one of the major contributions of the church was to bring the, the alive yeah. the Byzantine exactly to keep the Byzantine tradition alive, yeah, and, and keep it as a prominent factor of the uh, the celebrations. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Nikos Maikaridis is asking, quote, could Gonda clarify a bit further what she means when she says that the celebrations of Greek independence can be more inclusive? Uh, yes, and I'm glad you asked that. Thank you. Um, you saw me emphasize how the first celebrations are always very male oriented. Uh, women have a role to play. Um, I looked at the video beautifully filmed in the Panathenaic Stadium of young people running around dancing to the music of uh, Savopoulos and, and asked myself the question, um, is there room, for instance, for physically disabled people? in this celebration, uh, uh, people of a different skin color. Um, you know, we were talking about the symbiosis between the Greek Orthodox Church, but Greece added tremendous numbers of uh, Jewish, uh, Jewish communities to its territory after um, by adding Thessaloniki. So is, is there room for another religion? So, so these are questions we need to ask. Um, the fact that we, uh, Inclusivity needs to be built, and, and minorities are not very present. And, and I, I think especially, for instance, of physically disabled people or mentally disabled people, they are nowhere, anywhere, at any time. And so the fact that there is still a hidden side, the, the, the people who make up the Greek uh, is something we should question, and whether they should not be included in celebrations as well. Of course. Thank you. Uh, from Professor Timothy Moore, quote, 
How do you think Greek commemorations compare to those of other countries like the United States and France? And actually, forgive me before answering this, let me just mention to those of you who are watching us via YouTube, if you have any questions, please feel free to email me directly and I can pass it on to Professor Van Steen. So back to Professor Moore's questions, question, how do you think Greek commemorations compare to those of other countries like the United States and France? Um, I would say that there is definitely a factor of self-promotion that is uh, common to all. And, uh, you know, think of the Roman triumphal processions, think of the processions and the reenactments of the French Revolution, think of uh, the military hardware that the Russians bring out. So, so lots of uh, cultures actually take the moment of a parade to really show the hardware, the male strength. Uh, America uh, uh, has done its fair bit of that. I do, uh, you know, political speech making is part of it. Uh, photo ops with the politicians are, are big. I, I have certain, I have a certain uh, admiration for commemorations in the US that take a different um, aspect, for instance, I very much like the Vietnam Memorial, which is plain, simple, and, and where every name is an individual, and you're reminded of that in the simplicity of the monument. A little bit of an aspect of that comes back in the commemorations of 9-11, uh, you know, when names are being read out, but the stage is always shared with political speech making, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, I don't think we will ever be free of that component of, of seeing a propaganda opportunity that is as old as the Romans. Uh, I don't think we'll be, ever be free, but maybe the, the, burden, the burden rests on us to kind of filter those images a little bit and, and think critically of what it is we are being given. There is certainly, I mean, when I look at inaugural, um, events and the money being spent on them in the US, you just kind of think, oh my God, this could do so much good in the healthcare system. I cannot suppress that kind of, uh, that kind of um, uh, criticism. Um, but then of course, if they didn't do it, that doesn't mean the money would go to the healthcare system. So, so maybe I'm a little bit too idealistic there. But yes, I do have questions concerned, to, concerned with issues of self-promotion, utilizing or commodifying the event and the sheer cost of it, the sheer, sheer cost of it in times of crisis. Thank you. And we have one final, we have time for one final question. I have an email from John Cladeus, who's watching us through YouTube. Um, you mentioned uh, the 1821, 1830, 1921, 1930 shifting uh, yeah. anniversary. Are there other, other examples or other cases of shifting anniversaries? Well, I think this year is a case. A lot of the events were first postponed from the spring to the to the fall, and and um, people, you know, uh, in in London we are hosting twenty events in 21. That's the name of our program, 21 in 21. And some of these 21 will fall in 22, which is a little inappropriate because in, in 1922, we, we are not celebrating, we are commemorating and grieving a whole different kind of events. So we're kind of struggling with, yes, we need to postpone because the, the, the restrictions impose it upon us, but no, celebration is not appropriate in 1922, which should generate a different kind of event and and so it will be delay or cancellation uh, but we are caught by the same somewhat of the same conundrum of um, uh, that that occurred in 1921 in london we are now already seeing 2024 the dead of byron we could just you know uh, project all the way on to 2024 and uh, and make phil hellenism a component of it but you can kind of see that we're playing a little bit of a mental game with ourselves because we have no certainty of 2024 either right 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 of course you're, you're right and then well, actually we are here at the greek professorship guilty of the same uh, we fell in the same loop in the sense that we had to push our 2021 celebrations into 2022 simply because the university was closed last yeah. fall to public events. So you're absolutely right. Uh, Professor Van Steen, we are very grateful and very Thank honored you. that you joined us today. Thank you for a wonderful and inspiring presentation. On a personal note, I hope I'll see you perhaps in Greece in, in the summer. I hope so too, but I may, yeah. I may wait till the end of the summer just to be... Okay. 
entirely safe. And also you mentioned the May 28 event on yes. film. Would you like to send me the link and we can distribute it to our mail list? Uh, at will, some point? Just email it to me and we'll spread I will, it. I will do that. The only disadvantage is, and, and I'm sorry about that, we're holding it at 10 o'clock in London, which is brutally early at four o'clock uh, where you all are. And the reason is that we're also trying to include the Australians because one of our speakers is Australian. So this is our attempt to be global and inclusive, but at the cost of a few hours of sleep. That's fine. That's, if you didn't mind sending it to me, we'll just share I, it. I will do that. I will do Thank that. Thank you so and, much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We will take a hiatus over the summer. Our next event will be the Matsakis lecture at the end of August. And of course, we will send uh, the, the, uh, the appropriate announcements before that. Have a wonderful Sunday afternoon and a wonderful summer. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. I'm very honored. Thank you.